Hey guys, welcome to episode 37 and I'm so excited. We have Dr. Kalish here today with the Kalish Method and we're so glad to have you. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So tell us a little bit about your book and just a little bit about what inspired you to get started. So, you know, I practice functional medicine. I've always been interested in like human physiology and science. And it seemed like a good idea to combine what functional medicine does, which is lab analytics and really high level lab interpretation with natural health solutions. So it was always kind of, uh, to me, it's like the, the, the frontier of medicine really is to see how the human body works and how you can fix it without drugs or surgery. And that's, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting too now to watch because the functional medicine field is just exploding in the last two yeah, or three it years. Is. It is, we are just on fire mm-hmm. and I'm one of the old timers. So I'm kind of like the, uh, one of the spokespersons for the field, just because I've been around for so long, not because I'm the smartest guy, just because I've been doing this for 25 years. Well, and it's just crazy because most doctors that you see, you know, the first thing they're going to do is just throw prescription drugs at you, which unfortunately makes you worse, (laughs) you know? So, so explain to us exactly. Some people don't, don't really understand what is functional medicine? What does that mean for, for those listeners that don't know? Yeah, so there, there's a general field of alternative or integrative medicine. And that general field is all the things that doctors do that do not include drugs and do not include surgery, right? Things outside the scope of what you would do in a hospital. And so within the area of functional or alternative medicine, there's a subset of that, which is functional medicine. And functional medicine specifically uses lab tests for things like hormones and neurotransmitter levels and adrenal function and thyroid function and gut function and nutritional levels in an attempt to find out the problems that are plaguing people that are chronic, right? Not acute. So you break your arm, you break your leg, you go to a hospital, but you have diabetes. How do you reverse the diabetes, you know, or you have a chronic autoimmune condition? How can you treat that? And so functional medicine has sort of filled the gap for the diagnosis and treatment of chronic illness, basically, in the United States. That's kind of, and um, people are getting a little frustrated with being overweight and being tired all the time, and they don't want to necessarily take medication. I mean, that's what you hear all the time. It's like, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, and that's just a recurring theme that you're hearing over and over from people. Um, So tell me, you know, the term adrenal fatigue comes up more and more often, and explain to listeners what exactly is adrenal fatigue. Yeah, so it's important. It's, it's not a disease. You know, the adrenal glands can fail, and that's a medical crisis. It's called Addison's disease. And you would die if you didn't see your regular doctor and get treated. So that's the medical version of it. And then in the integrative or functional medicine version of it, what we look at is the adrenal glands becoming exhausted or fatigued before they actually fail, long before they fail. It has nothing really to do with, with Addison's disease. It's more just the response to stress. And there's three major sources of stress for most people, emotional, dietary, and inflammatory. And those three sources of stress can eventually exhaust the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands make a hormone called cortisol, which is really critical for a lot of different functions. And when your cortisol levels start to go out of balance, you know, people get physically exhausted or sometimes they actually get wired and tired. They get kind of anxious too. Um, so out of the, you said the main causes, you know, were you said dietary, inflammatory, and did you say emotional? Yeah. So out of those, what would you say is the number one? Like when, if you're looking at someone who has adrenal fatigue, what would it be? Would it be the dietary? Would it be the inflammatory and the emotional? And can you give an example of each? Sure. So I think the biggest pressures on us these days are emotional and spiritual, right? People are spiritually disconnected. They don't know why they're on this planet. They don't know what they're doing. They are not happy at some fundamental level. And yes. they have emotional pressures, bad marriages, raising mm-hmm. kids, working and commuting. I mean, clearly this country is disintegrating currently. You know, we can see that in terms of increasing pressure being put on people. Suicide rates are skyrocketing. 
drug addiction is at a level that no one could even comprehend with the opioid crisis, right? So things are bad in general on the emotional. Well, I have a, I know a guy who is a firefighter and I was out at a cookout and I said to him, let me ask you, what's the worst fire that you've ever done? You know, like been to, I was kind of wanting like a story or whatever. He said, I'm going to be real honest with you. He said, I might be a firefighter. He said, but my number one thing I do this these days is going to houses for suicide. He said, the suicide rate is so out of control. He said, I'm doing this much with fires and I'm doing this much with going to houses for suicide. Isn't that insanity? Yeah. It's crazy. It's happening. You know, you don't see it in the media every day, but between that and the opioid crisis, you know, we're just seeing, you know, the, de the, the survival rates, we call it the longevity rates for certain groups, like white men in their 30 to 50 age range are actually dropping. <laughs> like that's not supposed to happen when you have like an advanced medical system, like in the U S it's, it's, and a lot of it is drug overdoses and suicide. Mm -hmm. So anyways, that's, a, that's a big problem. So people so are you under would say pressure. emotional out of those, the emotional stress is what's really causing the adrenal glands to fail. Well, that's the most common one. Most people have all three of these. You know, it, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't a help. Combination. Yeah. If you eat poor quality food every day, that's going to just make everything worse. You know, if you're eating a lot of sugar or you're eating a lot of carbs or you're skipping meals, whatever the people is with your food. And then if you're chronically inflamed, if you have a gut microbiome problem or a liver toxicity problem and you're chronically inflamed, then that's going to contribute. And almost everyone that we work with in functional medicine has all three of these going on, emotional, dietary, and then inflammatory stress all at the same time. So talk about the liver toxicity for just a second. So what are some things that cause people's liver to be at toxic levels? What's, what's kind of crazy for me is I don't drink at all. Um, I maybe drink like four times a year. I just like to eat my calories. I don't like to drink them. And so, and I feel like I'm super fun. So I don't need to like, you know, drink to have fun. And so I just don't, I'm just not a big drinker. Um, but whenever I've ever gotten my lab work done, my doctor says that my liver function is off. Like they're always telling me that my liver function is not, is not right. Yeah, so there's endogenous toxins and exogenous toxins. There's one that comes, ones that come from the inside and ones that come from the outside. So in terms of things that come from the outside, you have the stuff that you do to yourself, cocaine, amphetamines, prescription drugs, recreational drugs, coffee. <laughs> you know, coffee is hard on your liver. Sugar is hard on your liver. Alcohol is obviously hard on your liver. So it's just stuff that we do to ourselves. And that's pretty obvious to recognize, you know, if I drink okay vodka every day my liver is going to be damaged but what's more insidious and more common and affects pretty much everyone in the united states is environmental toxin exposure so there's you know at this point i think the last thing i read was there's like eighty two thousand chemicals that are you know actively in the environment right now everything from ddt to to other pesticides herbicides heavy metals like arsenic lead cadmium mercury and when we test people and it's my job is doing the labs we find almost everyone has a very high level of either chemical or heavy metals and the research shows you know the average american has a minimum of 122 chemical compounds in their body flame retardants from your mattress and your couch i mean just all kinds of crap it's amazing and um babies are born with 50 to 70 identifiable toxins like the day they're born they, they just pick up from their mom when they're in utero so mm -hmm. it's a crisis you know and there, every single person in the united states has a certain level of toxic burden it's there's no more pristine place where you can live where you're not exposed to this and many of them are airborne some of them come from food and water and some of them just come from off gassing of materials like in your car or furniture or whatever it is you walk into a clothing store you have that weird smell from the clothing store that's formaldehyde from the clothes so you know, we're, we're kind of saturated with chemical toxins and some people are good at getting rid of these toxins and their liver is just like, no big deal. I'm going to flush out that mercury, lead and arsenic and DDT. And then other people are poor at detoxification and those are the people that are getting sick. Getting sick now. So let me ask you, you know, I've heard people as far as the heavy metals and the mercury. And um, I do know that like I have a couple of fillings and that are, you know, the metal fillings. And I've heard people say 
that that's something that you really should, you know, go to the dentist and get them to remove those fillings and put them into non-metal fillings. Do you agree with that or what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, there's no reason to have mercury in your mouth. And you just need to find a dentist that's qualified to remove them properly and then put in something that's less toxic. So that, that, that's, that's an obvious thing you should do. Mm-hmm. Anyone should do. But you have to be careful because if you're already sick and you get the, your fillings removed, it can cause a really big crisis. So it's not a good idea for people who are sick or having a lot of fatigue to rush out and get their fillings changed because it usually makes them worse. You have to, first of all, test with a functional medicine lab, the liver detox pathways, fix them, get the person healthier so they can handle the stress of the actual changing of the fillings. Because when they pull out the mercury filling, they're going to release a lot of mercury into your system. It's going to go right to your brain. And if you're not in good shape already, it's going to cause problems. Awesome. So tell us about your book. Um, This is an amazing book, but tell the readers, what is the Kalish method? And give us just like an overview of it. So it's a very simple explanation of um, the basics of functional medicine and how the different body systems interact and overlap and basically how they work. I also have, and your listeners may be interested, an adrenal masterclass that we can offer your listeners for free if they want to learn more about my ideas on the adrenals. Then that's an online awesome. training program we can offer your folks too. Okay, and tell everyone that site. Uh, I don't know, but my staff can send you the link so that you can post it. All right, I'll put that, I'll put that link in the show notes. So if you're listening, I'll go ahead and put that in the show notes for sure. Um, so you talk about mind mapping in your book. Can you expand on that just a little bit more? So we talked a little bit about hormones like cortisol and the adrenal glands and how they're responsible for fatigue. The other big, equally important source of fatigue for many people is what's happening with their brain. And so the mind mapping looks at neurotransmitter levels and what's happening in the brain and especially in terms of a chemical called dopamine, which is the main excitatory neurotransmitter. It's the one that gives us energy. So if you're sitting on the couch and you're like too tired or too depressed to do something, it could be that the adrenal hormones are underperforming or it could be that the dopamine levels in the brain are not working well. And so we test both, right? We test with salivary assays for the hormones. We look at cortisol and DHEA, map out what the adrenal glands are doing. And then there's these really sophisticated tests you can do to look at neurotransmitter production in the brain. All right, well, let's get right into our questions. We've got a bunch for you. This is Angel in New York. She said, I've just completed my first couple of 24 hour fast and I've been depending heavily on black coffee and unsweetened tea to get me through those bouts with hunger. The only bad thing is that I struggle with adrenal fatigue and I've heard that caffeine is harmful for me. Is this true? If so, do you have any recommendations for ways to wean myself off of it? I get major headaches when I try not to drink it. Yeah, so if you're dependent on caffeine to the extent that we don't drink it, you get headaches. That in and of itself... I would say generates the adrenal fatigue, right? Because the, cord- the caffeine forces the adrenal glands to make huge amounts of cortisol. So you get a temporary lift, but then it's just pushing the mechanism so, so hard. So, you know, the usual way to get off of caffeine is to cut your dose of caffeine in half every two weeks. So if you're drinking like four cups of coffee a day, cut it back to two for two weeks and then cut it to one cup of coffee for two weeks and just kind of gradually taper off. And then in the meantime, you know, to do something to boost the internal production of cortisol so you don't get incredibly tired. Now, my work is all based on labs, so I do the labs and then we recommend hormone support for cortisol and DHEA using the actual hormones. If you're not gonna do the labs, you can find sort of general adrenal support products. Adaptogenic herbs can work. B vitamins work pretty well, especially vitamin B5. Um, And so it's okay if you try those over-the-counter ideas for a couple months and see if they're enough to get you kind of back on track. There's some companies that make adrenal glandulars. Sometimes those help people. And if not, then you should probably find a functional medicine doctor, you know, grab a lab test and then, and then fix it in a more cohesive way. You know, but I think it's fine to do two to four months of self-treatment. Somebody, would you say that somebody who is struggling with adrenal fatigue, would you recommend them trying to wean themselves off of caffeine? Would that be one of your recommendations? Yeah, that's pretty basic. Especially if you're doing something to help support your adrenals at the same time. You should end up with 
a net of more energy at the end of that. Mm -hmm. So we got several questions um, just in this week that I'm not going to read all of them, but they all kind of said the same thing that this lady Donna in North Carolina says. She says, I'm so tired lately. As soon as I wake up, all I want to do is go to bed, but I feel like I'm getting enough sleep at night and I sleep eight to 10 hours. One of my girlfriend mentioned that this could be a candida issue. Another one says it could be a thyroid issue. Google tells me it's my liver or Epstein-Barr. I'm so confused. How can I tell the difference when all of these symptoms I'm finding are so similar? Yeah, for that, you have to do the functional medicine lab work, basically. Or you, There's no way you can guess your way out of that. So you mm -hmm. test the adrenal hormones. You test neurotransmitters. You test the mitochondria. You know, which are the portions of the cell that make energy. You test gut function, liver detox. You, you just have to do the lab work. And it's expensive. You know, a good lab workup could cost anywhere from like 200 to $800. But you could spend that much in a year on supplements that aren't going to work also, you know. So it's just a matter of, so, of finding someone who knows how to interpret the labs. You can help people as far as, so like we can have that, like they can call your office and they doesn't matter what, because we have listeners from all parts of the country. So they can call you and you can do their lab work and then you can go over all these results with them over the phone, correct? That is correct. I work with people all over the world. Yep. And and give everyone your, your website, would you? Yeah, it's kalishwellness.com. So K-A-L-I-S-H wellness.com. That's the patient website. And awesome. um, as long as you have a local medical doctor that you're seeing, you know, we can do the, the sort of functional medicine component of it over the phone. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Okay. This next question is Denise in Texas. For the past six months or so, I've noticed that I'm getting an insane spike of energy in the evening. At first, I thought this was related to intermittent fasting, but I started Googling and I stumbled upon info about adrenal fatigue. It was crazy. All of my other symptoms applied to me. It stinks to feel this way, but it's nice to have some what of a diagnosis. The thing I still can't figure out is why am I getting my energy burst in the evening and not earlier in the day when I'm more rested? And that's Denise in Texas. Man, I'm telling you, that's so funny. I, I don't think I've ever gotten a burst of energy at night. Like, I'm one of those people I get up very early in the morning and I like go, 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 and I have all this energy. But come the afternoon, I'm like dead in the water. But how would you answer yes. that? So there's the circadian rhythm, which is how the cortisol is released. So in the morning, you release like 20 units of cortisol, and then it drops throughout the day, and at night, it's down around two. It's a pretty big difference, right, of 10 times. So you wake up. What, what, one of the things that wakes you up is that there's a surge of cortisol right when the sun comes up. You know, whoop, time to wake up, around 20 units of cortisol, and then it drops to two around 9 or 10 at night. 11 at night, the latest when you're supposed to go to sleep. And so that's the rhythm, you know, and it just keeps going like this, hopefully every day. The closer you are to being in sync with that natural rhythm, the healthier you're going to be and the more energetic and vital you feel. If you get off of that rhythm, you know, you can do like, instead of being high in the morning, you can be low in the morning and then high at night. That is not good, right? So when we do the testing, it's a salivary test. You spit into a tube four times and it maps out four different points. And so the the person, the, the listener you're describing probably has a low cortisol early in the day and then it spikes at night. And there are specific supplements that will lower the high cortisol and different specific supplements that will bring up the low level. But you can't tell without a lab. So that's what the labs are for. And then once we see the lab, let's say it's inverse like your person is describing, low in the morning and high at night. You take the stuff that brings it up in the morning, you take the stuff that lowers it at night and you reset the rhythm and eventually, usually within six to 12 months, you don't need the supplements anymore because you're back in sync with this natural rhythm. Awesome. Um, so next question is from Valerie in Columbia. Since I read your book, she's talking about the book I wrote, I do my best to stick with the 80-20 principle and do, my, do allow myself all of my favorite foods that I enjoy. But recently, my doctor determined that I'm dealing with adrenal fatigue and I'm wondering if I should adjust my diet will help some. Are there certain foods I should avoid and others I should make sure that I'm eating plenty of? I'm desperate to feel better and I'm willing to tweak my diet if that will help. Yeah, so in general, if you're dealing with adrenal fatigue and you want to eat 
properly for that problem, you want to make sure that you just focus on keeping your blood sugar stable so that you're eating three times a day, you're not skipping meals, and you're not completely overdoing it with just carbohydrate-only meals. Mm -hmm. You have some kind of either plant or animal protein with each meal. And some people, if they're in really bad shape, need to even do snacks in between meals. Um, the things that really throw off the adrenals even more are the things that we all want to do because, you know, caffeine, sugar, all the good stuff, you know, um, mm -hmm. just makes the adrenal problem worse. But when you have the adrenal problem, you crave that stuff, right? Because your blood sugar is bouncing up and down typically. So you're going to crave sweets and you're going to want caffeine because your energy is low. So there's kind of a, a little bit of a catch-22 there in that it's, it's hard to resist. Once you're in adrenal fatigue, it tends to perpetuate itself because the behaviors that you are going to be drawn towards are going to make it worse. Hey guys, I'm so excited that my new book, Waste Away, The Chantel Rayway, is now available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and pretty much anywhere you can find books. But we also have the audio book, the ebook, and my new recipe book that you can download all the recipes that I love that I make, and it's super cheap. It's all my favorites. Anyway, if you have a minute to write a review on Amazon, I would be ever grateful. All right, this is from Karen in Tampa. After struggling to conceive for several years, I'm finally pregnant. Congratulations. She says, I'm so thankful, but became a little discouraged when I learned that it's possible I could pass my adrenal fatigue down to my child. Is this true? And is there any way to prevent it? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, I would say, you know, moms pass down a lot of things to their babies. Your hormonal status is, you know, part of that. You know, whether you, what your thyroid is doing, what your adrenals are doing. Um, your nutritional status is part of that. Obviously, what you're eating. Um, probably the biggest factor is the microbiome, right, which is the gut bacteria that the mom passes on to the baby. So in the scheme of things, there's not much you can do while you're pregnant about correcting your adrenal fatigue other than just getting plenty of rest and taking, you know, a prenatal and doing all those kind of basic things, just looking after yourself. Um, but there's a lot you can do for your microbiome, which is probably, I would say, 10 or more times more important in terms of what your kid's going to inherit because they're going to have that microbiome basically for the rest of their lives, right? Whatever you're giving them. And so that revolves around, um, you know, probiotic supplements a little bit, but I'm not really big on the supplements. I think you do a lot of this with food, you know, trying to eat fermented foods or foods that have, you know, um, probiotics in them, uh, trying to make sure that you focus on lots of fruits and vegetables so you get the polyphenols. Those polyphenols are what the bacteria in the gut need to feed on, the good bacteria feed on. And then having small portions of uh, foods that are high in fiber, there's specific fiber, types of fiber in food that the good bacteria grow on, and most especially with beans. So a little bit of lentil soup or some black beans or pinto beans or hummus or something like that. Uh, at least a couple times a week. So you're feeding the good bacteria to get the microbiome healthier. Um, the treatments that we do to fix the adrenals is not really great to do while you're pregnant. And so you, you really can't take a lot of those herbs or products while you're pregnant. Got it. All right, Kate in Arizona, she says, I have struggled with adrenal fatigue for the past year or so, and the more I learn about it, I see that stress is a major factor in how I'm feeling. I don't want to take anxiety medicine, and quitting my job isn't an option. Do you have any suggestions for stress management? Yeah, so assuming you're not going to see a doctor and you're going to try to do this on your own, I think you know, the fallback options are about meditation. It's kind of obvious, right? Some kind of, you know, good meditation, relaxation exercise that you do on a daily basis. And then exercise is a great way to sort of relieve stress and get your mind on track and to help the adrenals. Not over-exercise, not like training for a marathon, but, you know, the basics, you know, 30 to 60 minutes a day of some kind of rational exercise program. Yeah, I think that, that's a big one for me. Like walking or, you know, any kind of Pilates and things like that. Those are big ones for me for removing stress. All right, Jennifer in Louisiana says, I'm excited to learn more about adrenal fatigue on your upcoming show. As someone who doesn't know much about it, what are the most common symptoms that we should be aware of? 
Uh, let's see. Well, what it depends. There's tired? a lot of. Yeah, well, being well, being tired in a specific way, though. So being tired and not recovering from rest. So like it's normal to be tired if you worked really hard all day. But then, you know, if you have a day or two off of work, you should feel better. So it's a fatigue that goes, that does not go away, mm -hmm. even if you're resting and sleeping a lot. That's one mm -hmm. way to kind of obviously spot it. The other is unwanted and unsightly and unpleasant fat accumulating, especially around your trunk area, truncal fat or abdominal fat. So when the adrenals are stressed, you don't burn fat very well and you store fat around the abdominal organs. So that's another way you can see. Um, and it doesn't burn off real fast, right? Because the stress is what's putting it there. It's not necessarily that you're eating too many calories. Stress in and of itself, in, even in the absence of tons of calories, will, will cause your body to store fat. Um, and then mood. You know, if you're normally an upbeat person that wants to go and see movies and do stuff and you're acting kind of depressed and you don't want to go out, you're feeling like you need to isolate yourself more or you're just irritable all the time, you know, I, I would say those are probably the big three. Got it. All right. Ashton in Charlottesville. My favorite thing about this podcast is you're always introducing me to natural ways that I can cure my body, which is good because my doctor won't acknowledge adrenal fatigue as a real disorder and says there's nothing he can do for me. What are some ways that I can combat it naturally? Are there any herbs or supplements that I can take? Yeah. So I suggest people try this for like two to four months. If it's not working, you should find a doctor that can do a test like me, okay? But in the, as a warm up, there's four lifestyle things. Getting to bed early is probably the hardest and most important. That's easy for me. I go to bed at 8.45. <laughs> Nine is better. Nine, eight, 9 p.m., 10 at the latest. So going to okay. sleep on time. Um, not skipping meals, right? So, you know, and not eating stupid food. I don't eat a ton of things that are bad for you. And then um, the exercise that we talked about, not crazy, but, you know, at least an hour a day of some kind of decent exercise every day. And then um, some kind of stress management strategy where you're dealing with meditation. So exercise, sleep, the diet, and then meditation. Those four things you can do on your own to help. And then on the supplement side, there are adaptogenic herbs that you can buy. Most companies will have these formulas. They'll have ashwagandha or ginseng or rhodiola, these kinds of things that are designed for people with either high or low cortisol. When you're stressed, they help you, you know, kind of relax and re respond to the stress more appropriately. And then there's glandulars. If you're not a vegan and not a vegetarian, there are animal-based products that have adrenal hormone support factors, adrenal glandulars, another category the plant-based category, there's the glandulars, and then there's the basic nutrients that the adrenals need. Number one would probably be magnesium, if you're mm -hmm. really stressed. Magnesium. Magnesium's a big one for me. That, that's, that's one that's really, and don't they say how many of us are, are deficient in magnesium? Well, unless you're eating green leafy vegetables five times a day, you're probably deficient in magnesium. Yeah, pretty much everyone. Right. Everyone we test right. is low. So magnesium helps tremendously. And then panathenic acid, which is also called vitamin B5, that can help a lot as well. Um, all the B vitamins, I guess, help, but B5 is the one that's sort of the standout if you want to go the nutritional route. And a lot of companies will have an adrenal formula and it'll have you know, the B vitamins and magnesium and other stuff all in it, or you can buy them separately. Just make sure you get good quality versions of the supplements, that's all. Awesome. Um, so this is Melanie in Virginia Beach. I have only ever met women who deal with adrenal fatigue, but I'm finding out that there are men who struggle with it as well. Would you say that it's more prevalent in women? I'm familiar with how it manifests in a woman. Are the symptoms going to be different for men and what should men watch out for? So... Women's hormonal systems are more complex. They have cycling levels of progesterone and estrogen that are different every day of the month. How crazy is that, right? That's really complicated. And when you're under adrenal stress, the progesterone and estrogen levels are going to be impacted. So women will notice problems more obviously than men and maybe, maybe earlier in the process because they're paying attention to their hormones usually more than men are. 
women are generally paying more attention to their health than men, and women also seem to complain a little earlier in the cycle of not feeling good than men. Men tend to hold out until something desperate has happened, you know? So I think there's, there's kind of like psychosocial variables going on as well. Now, for men that have adrenal exhaustion, they'll have low sex drive, low mood, or to be depressed. They'll put on the abdominal fat. Um, they just don't feel like being as active as they used to. They might get kind of cranky and irritable. Um, they tend to become less effective at work. You know, their brains aren't working as crisply as they used to, um, those kinds of things. But most of the men that come into my practice, you know, have waited many, many more years to deal with a problem than the women that come in. Women seem to be more proactive in this way. Awesome. All right. We have one last question. It's Sally from Phoenix, Arizona. She says, I'm taking the probiotic that you recommended on one of your shows, but I'm taking about six a day. Sometimes it makes me feel a little bit sick, but I think it's really helping my disorder. Um, do you think that's too many? Like, do you have a probiotic that you recommend? And what would you say is a, is a good amount? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's three companies out there that you can buy from, from Amazon that are good. I only sell supplements to people who are patients of mine. So if you're not a patient, I can't sell you anything. I mean, I obviously have all the good stuff, but it's just for patients. But the three companies you can buy from Amazon for probiotics would be Metagenics, really good quality stuff. Any of their probiotics are really good. Pure Encapsulations, everything they sell is excellent and then designs for health. And they're all about equal. These are three professional lines. They mostly sell through doctors, although you can usually get them from Amazon. And any of those companies, you know, they have just slightly different formulas and whatnot, but they're, they're gonna be about the same level of super high quality. And probiotics are one thing you don't wanna buy in a health food store or from, you know, a local grocery store because they go bad pretty quickly and you don't wanna take a probiotic that's supposed to be putting good bacteria in you and it's full of mold and nasty organisms, right? It's just kind of not a healthy, good thing to do. So um, the, any one of those three companies can work. And then dosages, you have to be, I mean, if you're going to get beyond the, the recommended dose on the label, you should be talking to a professional who knows what they're doing. So if you, if the label says two a day and you're taking six, then you're already kind of treating yourself and you should be talking to some kind of, naturopath or doctor or someone that can help you monitor things and figure out why you need so much. Um, it's not a good idea to just self-prescribe and self-treat and get dosages super high because there could be something really important going on that you're missing, like a major digestive tract infection or food allergy or something else that's going on, you know? What is your opinion on those food allergy tests? You know, I've taken, I've taken some different ones and it's funny because they all kind of say something different. You know, I've had one that said I was allergic to like iceberg lettuce. And then I had one that said, I mean, just like such random stuff. Um, but what do you, what is your opinion on those, those food allergy tests? It's very there's no completely accurate food allergy test. So some of them overcompensate and some undercompensate. So some of the testing will have false positives, meaning that there's food allergies that'll show up in the test that you don't really have. And some will have false negatives where they'll miss allergies that you have. It's a really difficult thing to test for. Um, and so there's no perfect science around this. I'm not against food allergy testing. I don't do it in my practice anymore. I used to for a long time, but there are still some really good companies out there. Probably the leading company that does food allergy testing is called Genova Labs, and they have good quality tests, but you have to have a doctor order it because it's a blood test. Um, and so there are ways to assess that. And um, mo you know, there's probably six or eight good food allergy testing companies out there. Another really popular one is called Cyrex Labs, C-Y-R-E-X. Again, you have to order that through a doctor. And so it's a complicated area, and that like you've already noticed, you know, they're, each lab has different techniques on how they're measuring and you can have these discrepancies because there's no perfect way to do it. And, you know, some of the testing, it matters what you eat before the test, right? So what your diet was in the days or weeks before the lab will impact the lab. Other mm -hmm. lab companies are trying to work around that. If you're testing 100 different foods to see what you're allergic to, you can't eat 100 different foods in three days, right? So there's, there's some profound limitations to it. However, all that being said, sometimes they help people dramatically. In the hands of a good doctor, a food allergy test can be really helpful if they know how to interpret it properly. 
Good. Well, anything else that you, I'm out of questions for you today, but anything else that you would say to someone who, because I would say that, you know, the majority of our questions are really from people saying, I'm so tired. Like I can't figure out what's going on. I guess, like you said, they need to contact you to go ahead and, and do that blood work. I know I'm doing it a hundred percent. You I, I'm going to be one of your, you know, first ones from the podcast. So there, I mean, for the fatigue thing alone, there's like four areas you need to think through. Is it my thyroid, my adrenals, my mitochondria, or my brain? So the mitochondria, ex, ex, like the thyroid, we get it, like that one makes sense. But th explain the mitochondria a little bit more in detail. Yeah, in some ways, this is the most important one. So. If you take a breath in and then breathe out and then hold your breath, like how long can you really do that for? How long does that feel good? So mitochondria take oxygen from the air that we breathe and they convert it into cellular energy. That's how we move around and think and do stuff. And if you want to think about how important the mitochondria are, just try holding your breath and see how long you can last. I mean, so they're more important than the adrenals and the thyroid and you can live without your thyroid. They take the thyroid out, right? And you can still survive with the right drugs. If your adrenals fail, you can take steroids the rest of your life. You can still survive. I guess you can't live without your brain. The brain's pretty important too, but um, mitochondrial energy is like the currency of the body. If you don't have that, you're going to be exhausted and all these other systems fail. And so there's some really complicated tests that you can do to look at mitochondrial function. And this is one of my areas of specialty I've been doing the last two or three years. I've been focusing on this. Um, pretty seriously and a lot of people have mitochondrial problems and it's not really their adrenals that are causing the fatigue and in fact you know I I talk about this openly in my doctor training program but if I look at all of my adrenal fatigue patients who failed on the adrenal programs that I designed so we did the lab we put them on the right supplements and their adrenals didn't then their fatigue didn't get any better their adrenals got better but their fatigue didn't get better all of those patients had mitochondrial problems. And so it's a big deal. And the mitochondria are damaged by environmental toxins. Mm. Sad, but that's what happens. You get these chemicals and heavy metals in and boom, they hit the mitochondria and they just blow them up. It's like taking a, a shotgun and just putting it right in someone's face and shoot, pulling the trigger. It's just like mitochondria mm. are just gone. And some people just don't have enough mitochondria anymore. And so they're just suffering from this chronic fatigue. And is that, is that what you would do if, if someone's, if you did the blood work and they saw that was the issue, is that those supplements that you sell them that kind of help the, the mitochondria? Yeah. Yeah. So we, for the mitochondria, it's not a hormonal system like thyroid or adrenals. We literally have to rebuild the mitochondria using free form amino acids, CoQ10, magnesium, carnitine. There's all these key nutrients that you use to get the mitochondria up and running. And um, I'd say that's a more, it's a really common problem. It's as probably as common as adrenal fatigue, but it's more complicated in how to diagnose and treat it. So most of the functional medicine doctors can, can miss oh, that one. You know? And then the last one was the brain. And with that, you mean just the stress that you're under. Is that, is that what you're thinking? No, how the, how the brain is at, the amount of neuro, neurotransmitters, the amount of brain chemicals your brain is actually generating. You know, if that number is low, then you're, you're mm -hmm. going to be exhausted all the time. And we can measure that level as well. And then that you would be able to cure with the, with the additional supplements that you guys offer, correct? Yeah, we find out what brain chemical is off, and then we target that brain chemical with, with the precursors, the nutrients that you use to make that chemical, so the levels just come up. I mean, that one's, I shouldn't say it's simple, but it's simple once you know how to do it, you know? Uh, it's easy to teach. I can teach a doctor how to do the brain programs in a month or two, you know? Once you see the labs, it's not that hard. That is so awesome. Well, first of all, thank you so much for being on the show. And this was so informative. And you must have just such a rewarding job because I've seen, you know, some of the testimonials that you have that are so amazing of how people have come to you and they're just so tired and they have all these issues and how you've just turned their their life around um, through functional medicine. So it just must be so rewarding for you. It really is. I, you know, I'm just the luckiest guy in the world. I would do this for fun if I had, you know what I mean? It's like yeah. a musician that just would play music and they yeah. work at a, as a waiter so they can play music at night. I'm kind of like that with functional yeah. medicine. It's really yeah. satisfying and it's, it's nothing better than turning around someone's life and all of a sudden they get their life back and they're, 
off and running to do whatever they're here to do, you know? So one more time, if you'll tell everyone your website and if they want to get your book, is it Amazon the best place or do you have a website that they could go to? Well, we can give you guys, your listeners, a free copy of the book. Oh, that's and awesome. Then, yeah, that's fine. We do that. But an ebook, I won't mail it, but you, know, you can download it yeah. and read it. And then... Um, and how do they get that? How do they get that? We can send you the link for that or give you the PDF. Okay, perfect. Um, awesome. So the free book and then the Adrenal Masterclass, if you guys want to listen to that, it's a bunch of hours yes. on adrenals. And then the connection is kalishwellness.com. So K-A-L-I-S-H wellness.com is the patient website if people are interested in signing up. Awesome. Well, thanks again. And folks, we'll have all this stuff in your show notes and we'll see you next time. And don't forget, if you have a question that you want answered, you can text it to 757-412-9278 or you can email us at questions at com. See you next time. Bye-bye.